<laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, shit. It's my turn. Okay. <laughs> my bad. All right. Here we go. There's our cold open already. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Woo-hoo. All right. We're <laughs> Welcome to episode 14 of the Plastic Posse Podcast. The Plastic Posse Podcast is sponsored by Goodman Models, makers of the terrific super sanding blocks. If you don't already own a set of these, head on over to goodmanmodels.com and order a set of these from our friend Anthony. John, TJ, Doug, how's it going? I'm hanging in there trying to stay warm. Yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm doing wonderful, thank you. (laughs) We also wanted to let everyone know that episode 14 of the Triple P is sponsored by Rick Baker, Rick Lewis, and Terry Wilkinson, who has made his support monthly. Thanks, Terry, and also an anonymous donation. Thanks, guys. These Posse members all used our PayPal.me link to help us out. We appreciate it. If you are enjoying the podcast and you would like to help out the Posse, it's really easy. So please visit PayPal.me, and thanks so much. Yeah, just go to our website, PlasticPossePodcast.Buzzsprout.com. There's no www. And in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little heart icon. You can also access this heart link on any of our podcast episode pages on the site. Just click little heart, and then you can donate any amount you would like. We would really appreciate the support. If you don't want to donate, that's okay. You can still support the show by taking a few moments and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts from. A five-star review really helps us get the show out to more people who might be interested in scale modeling podcasts. We would also like to give a shout out and much love to our fellow scale modeling podcasts. They're all great and they're lots of fun and great guys. So give them a, give them a listen. It's on the bench from down under with Dave, Ian and Julian plastic model mojo with Mike and Dave, different Dave's just so you know, those two are different Dave's scale model podcast with Stuart and friends model geeks with Darren and the crew. They're on episode three. And just making conversation with James and Malcolm. We also follow and enjoy some other great content creators. Sprue Pies with Frets with Stephen Lee. And Jim Bates, a Scale Canadian TV on YouTube. So up next, we have our social media shout outs. So this is our kind of new segment where we talk about different content creators on the various social media platforms. And uh, kind of highlight what they're doing and, and help get the word out to some of these amazing uh, creators so you know, our listeners can go check out their work. Today, we're going to start with uh, Paper Cuts, which is a YouTube channel. And it's paper, but it's P-A-E-P-E-R Cuts. They make a lot of terrain, uh, an interesting terrain you know, that you could use for wargaming or like diorama work. John turned me on to this channel today, actually, and, and I was kind of cruising through the videos. And I have to say, this is like really impressive stuff. The, these trees are just out of this world. I mean, they're, they look like real little miniature trees. It's pretty cool. So I would definitely check these out, uh, these videos out. I'm going to check these videos out because I had not heard of this channel before, and, and I don't know why. So yeah, get on YouTube and uh, check them out. Great recommendation, JB, and I'm looking at it right now, too, and it looks pretty awesome. Then over on the Facebook side, we have uh, DB Scale Model Studio, and that is run by a guy named David Bridges, who is a friend of the podcast and is very engaged with all of us and, and also me personally on my own Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, you should check out his work. It's really solid, and he has a does a wide variety of different, I think mainly armor, and a super nice guy too in, in all of our interactions with him. He also does some airplanes as well, but it looks like mainly armor. Yeah. Have you guys seen that T 3476 he's been working on? Um, 
the model and also the wooden base that he's put that on. It's a, it's incredible. Yeah, he does solid work. I really like that. And, you know, his previous work with a uh, King tiger or sorry, a Yog tiger he made last year. He did all the Zimmerit work himself, really tight, great photography as well. And, and as TJ mentioned, you know, super nice guy and always willing to share, you know, his techniques and how he builds. So yeah, definitely give this page a look, DB scale model studio. All right. And then uh, hopping over to my favorite world, Instagram. There's a guy named Ben Crawley, and his Instagram tag is just Ben underscore underscore Crawley, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y-7. I've been following him for a while. He's, I think, relatively new to Instagram based on his you know a number of posts, but he's been doing some fantastic armor work. Um, he did an Easy 8 Sherman that he finished up not too long ago that was spectacular, and then he also recently finished uh, TACOM Object 279 in 170 second scale. If you're not familiar with uh, Object 279, it's a weird esoteric Russian, you know, post-war Russian tank that looks like a UFO on four sets of tracks. It's it's bizarre, but it's really cool. But he did one, I think just recently, and he, yeah, just last month, and he posted it. And it's spectacular, especially for 170 second scale. It does not look like it's 170 second. And I think right now he's working on a Hetzer, which, you know, you can never go wrong with the Hetzer. They're, they're always good fun. So yeah, if you're um, on Instagram, I would uh, highly suggest checking him out. Um, he's doing some really great work. Yeah, this is great. You know, TJ, <laughs> you've introduced me to somebody that I've never heard of before. So this is awesome. I'll certainly go over and give his page a like. I mean, he builds armor, very high caliber. It even looks like he's got some aircraft mixed in. And then, you know, a diversity of subjects from World War II all the way to, you know, modern, modern Russian. So really talented stuff going on here. Awesome. And I wanted to mention, actually, uh, JB, uh, he's been working on that new DOS work, uh, World War I German U-boat, Dugues, uh, Dugues models, Matt McDougall. He recently did this and uh, did a great job. And now JB's adding his handiwork on one. And John, the salt work that you're doing on those uh, panels and the rivets on the whole of the submarine, that's just really Oh, thanks, terrific. man. You know, it's a couple layers of hairspray. And then what I found was I, I followed 70 Skid. It's it's a gentleman we mentioned earlier in the podcast uh, on another episode where he's a master modeler when it comes to U-boats, Scott Withers out of Michigan. And he turned me on to adding a very almost transparent layer of white on top of uh, that dark gray and then you can wear it, uh, you know, wear it away using the hairspray method. And it creates this really unique patina that isn't overwhelming that I think after you add some washes and some other effects, it's just really going to bring out texture that, you know, isn't molded onto the model. So for 70 second scale, it's very hard, I think, to add surface texture, especially to large pieces like that. And and it's, you know, I'll post some more pictures, but I, I'm really enjoying it so far. So I appreciate the, the shout out. Yeah, you can check that out over at John's uh, Facebook page, which is uh, JB Closet Modeler. And then if you want to check out Matt's uh, take on the same model, you can see that over at uh, Matt's uh, Dugues Models on either YouTube or Facebook. And you can check that out. Anyway, great job by uh, both of those guys on that submarine. That looks like a really nice kit. Yeah, I was talking to our buddy Patrick over at Andy's Hobby Headquarters online. And he was telling me that those DOS work uh, U-boat kits are just sailing out of his company there. And he's is having trouble keeping up with demand. I see what thing. you did there, by the way. I, I got that. I don't know if you meant to do that, but that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, that was good. I liked it. All right. Also wanted to mention last time uh, was kind of our first time trying this new social media shout out segment and it's been really really popular we've had a lot of comments on it john is going to add all these links to our facebook page and i'll make sure to add the links uh, to these pages that we've discussed uh, to our show notes as well so you guys can access all this really awesome content that we uh, are discovering here yeah and one thing i'd like to add scott you know the listeners if you have someone that you want to give a shout out to please recommend them to the page we'd love to explore what they're doing and and give them a shout out what has everybody been working on? And man, I want to start with uh, the the man, the machine, the myth, TJ here. Holy cow, dude. 
you are just, uh, I mean, your output has been unreal. What is, uh, what is lighting the fire on your bench there, man? Well, first of all, it's not that impressive. Let, let's start there because there's a lot of caveats to the reason why I have four kits done the second week of February. First of all, the, the stug or the stug or whatever you want to call it was like really close to being painted, like all the way painted because it's, it was two colors. So that one, okay, that one was, was close. And then the other one, the other one that I want to like caveat is the little 172nd uh, Mark II female tank from Masterbox. It's a 172nd scale tank. So it's like fits in the palm of your hand. You know, that was just like a for funsy type of thing. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, In our end of the year podcast, when we talked about our New Year's hobby re- uh, uh, resolutions, one of mine was to f- try to clear out my backlog of partially completed kits. So all four kits that I've finished so far were all in progress when I, you know, went back to them after, you know, January 1st. So the Firefly was mostly built when I, that was the first one I did. The Stug, like I was saying, was already painted in its base Dunkelgelb, which then got Olive Drab on top of that because it's a captured, it, it represents captured vehicle that there's a picture of, which is cool. The ones I recently finished before the last time I think we recorded, which I think may even be the Stug too, but the Armored Fighting Suit Polar Bear, which is a machining creator kit, was also partially built. And then the um, Master Box 172nd scale Mark II was also more or less painted. Um, and that I just kind of had that one kicking around on the desk for if I needed something to do or something to distract me. I would oh, add some more dirt or mud tones on it because it's so tiny. You can, you know, you can paint it so quickly. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do. I've got a lot more left that I want to finish this year, um, including the Rifle Models T3485. <laughs> that is almost ready for primer. Uh, maybe I can get it ready this uh, this coming week, maybe even this weekend. But then, um, you know, like Scott, you and I were talking last night. I mean, I have that Tamiya ISU 152 that's already painted that I could probably finish relatively quickly. And then I just got a bunch of other stuff, too. So, yeah, I, I'm hoping whatever it is that has uh, blossomed inside of me. Uh, continues because I, I want to get all these models done. I've been modeling a long time or not a, that long of a time, but you know, almost 10 years. And I look at my display cabinet and I hardly have anything in it. So I'm like, well, you know, what am I actually doing with all my time? Well, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, kudos for taking that new year's resolution um, seriously. And it's been pretty inspiring to see your work listeners out there if you haven't you can look on our facebook page or you you can go to orion paintworks and check those out guys i don't know which one that you guys think is 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 the best it's all terrific work but that super armored fighting suit the polar bear man tj i think you really upped your game with the weathering on that one thank you i think it's all right it could be better but i like the stug really nice work on the od over hands are yellow and the crew guys look great too man don't sell yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. It's not that I sell myself short. It's just I know they could be better. So it's like Mike Rinaldi said: "Don't fall in love with your own work." So if he says it, I'm gonna. Yeah, you should I'm probably go just take send that it advice. To me. You can just. <laughs> I'll send you my address. Just FedEx it over. <laughs> well, I'm, take, I'm taking it to Vegas with me. So. Yeah, you can send me that Firefly. I'll take that off your hands. <laughs> I, I'm. I'm willing to take one for the team. Doug, what have you been up to? Uh, how's that basement uh, construction project coming? Uh, well, I have door a door installed in my model room. Got six doors total I need to install in the basement. See, the thing is, I, I don't think I've explained this. My daughter comes home. She's been gone for a year and a half. She'll be home in two weeks. Right now, her room has two of my snakes, my computer, and a few other things and she needs it back, and I don't have anywhere to put them. So I have two weeks to have this this done, and I'm getting there. I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing floors probably on Monday. So man, that's awesome! It sounds like that. that's coming right along. But you've got a a deadline uh, keeping you keeping you honest on it. It sounds like. Yeah. I was gonna say I could yeah. I could do everything except the snakes. That's uh, 
I'm like Indiana Jones in that regard. Oh, man, we should bring you out here. I know somebody you should meet. All right. When I move, when I come out west, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hang out. All right. JB, what have you been working on besides that big old U-boat? Oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm bogged down in two big projects right now, and this is how I don't like to model. Um, usually, I always, you know, I prefer having a, a slammer build at any one time on the bench. But right now, you know, as we've talked about this, this sub that's it's going well um i had some decal issues with the big uh numeral on the front of the ship you know i I, in honest review i i think the film is a little thick and i wasn't liking uh how it looked after some clear coats so i i took it off and kind of masked that panel and repainted it so i'm trying to match it up with the panels next to it and it's it's a struggle but I'm going to get through it. And by the end of today, I hope to have it flat coated so I can start weathering tomorrow. In addition to that, I'm working on another project uh, for a publication with a, with a, uh, you know, a destroyed vehicle and it's going good. You know, it's, it's one of those projects, again, you start to get bogged down in because there's so much going on and it's like a mini diorama. There's an interior, a figure is involved, obviously groundwork. So those things really suck the life out of me and specifically the mojo gets really low. So once these two projects are kind of done and dusted by the end of the month, I'm probably going to buy the new T3485 by Tamiya and literally slam it together in a day and hopefully have it finished within a couple of days after that to get, to get kind of the momentum going again, because these are just, these are just draining right now. That's a great idea. Those 48 scale Tamiyas are really good mojo boosters and Hey, you can throw that in the uh, the T thirty four eighty five group build, which man, that group just continues to uh, get bigger and bigger. We're over uh, two hundred eighty members now, and a lot of the new members are making some great contributions. If you guys will recall, JB does a great kind of step by step article um, that we pinned as an announcement in the group. That's a really good reference point. That's actually what I've been up to. I My uh, T3485 is kind of inching forward. I've got it all painted. I've got it distressed. I've got a filter on it. So my next steps on that are going to be airbrushing the turret markings and then uh, starting on the paint chipping and the pen washes, you know, that and uh, continuing to Facebook message TJ and say, dude, where's your T34, man? Come on. It's coming. I promise. I promise. It'll be done. Maybe by the end of this month, if you get lucky. <laughs> That's an aggressive timeline. I like it. I, I was going to go back to your build because, you know, I, I think you kind of had a panic attack this last, uh, what, two days ago when you started to do your distressing. You didn't you didn't trust the process, man. You got to have the faith. Tell us a little bit about that. I opened a brand new bottle of the scratches effect and uh, put down kind of what I normally do, which is two thin coats. It must have been a really, really fresh batch or something because, man, I started chipping. I put a lighter a lighter coat over. I've got kind of a rich green base, and I put a kind of a light 4BO mix over the top of it, and I started chipping, and, man, that stuff just came up like there was no tomorrow. And, it, yeah, I wasn't happy, but I kept with it. I kept chipping it back and kind of kept working with it and then uh, ended up unifying it a little bit and blending it together with a really nice mig uh, green gray uh filter so it's kind of kind of looking okay now but yeah i was a little little panicked at first you know i i want to highlight what you talked about there about that green gray filter i i like the photographs i think you posted them on the facebook group and if you haven't i i hope you can because it really shows um you know what a subtle you know simple filter can do to bring a model to life i really like the effect that it you know, created on that model. And, and as you mentioned it, you know, it, it just, it just brought it to where it needed to be. And and it's actually in my cart right now to buy from, buy from someone. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I would agree. I I haven't traditionally done a lot with filters, but I've been using them kind of more and more. And you used a filter on, uh, on your T3485, I believe. And I really, I really like the way that uh, that went down, and it, like you said, it kind of really does a really good job of blending and unifying the finish, kind of richens it up a little bit. So, yeah, I like it a lot. Well, speaking of group builds and uh, group build updates, our new 
TIE Fighter Group build has been launched, and uh, we're up over 50 members on that, so it's growing. TJ, you've uh, you've got a really big start on on that as well. I can't remember if I talked about it when we announced the group build, but I I chose to do the Fine Molds 148 scale TIE Fighter, which I have had on the shelf since, I don't even know, when, like right after I got into scale modeling, so like probably like eight years ago. After I figured out that there was Star Wars kits, it was this was before Bandai, so all you know, Fine Moles was pretty much the only game in town. So I just you know bought and bought and bought. So yeah, I it's a really cool kit. Um, it's awesome that it's it's so large because I've only ever built seventy second scale uh, Tie Fighters. I real I did not remember buying this, but when I opened the box, I had the Paragraphics Photo Etch up, upgrade fret for it. Um, so I didn't use any interior stuff because that's for lighting it, and I'm not big into lighting models. But uh, I did all the ex. I think almost all the exterior photo etch. There's a couple pieces I was like, nah, I'm not, I don't feel like messing with. But uh, yeah, you have to shave all the surface detail off and add it back with photo etch. It's pretty cool. I know I sent you guys a picture this morning. Um, it's pretty much ready for primer right now. So maybe after we're done recording today, I might I might hit it with some black primer. Doug and uh, JB, what did you guys decide again on what is your subject? I haven't made my decision yet. Well, I've got I've got a tie striker, the seventy second scale Bandai tie striker. I actually broke out the box. I was able to dig it out of uh, the pile of boxes of kits that I have, and I put some uh, paint inside the cockpit. So that's a start. I actually used my airbrush, which I really felt good. Well, you are further than me. I still have mine in the box. It is Fine Molds tie interceptor, so it's a little older. I think I picked it up at a show with uh, the regular tie fighter. And I'm excited to build it. I've been looking at it for a while. I have masks for the uh, canopy dome, and I also have some kill marks on it. And yeah, super excited to get started as soon as these two laborious projects are out of the way. There's a lot of good stuff coming in this group build. Um, Between Dukes and his 3D printed 48 scale interceptor, and then all the different kits that people are working on, I'm really excited to see what we get. Yeah, I am too. And uh, we've got a guest coming up later in this episode. We're going to be talking with Tony Bell. And uh, he's done a, a really nice interceptor before. Maybe we can arm wrestle him into joining our group build as well. And then um, let's see what else in the news. Oh, hey, let's uh, let's talk about the 2021 IPMS Nationals Vegas, baby. All four of us have our uh, travel arrangements uh, set. We, the Plastic Posse is going to be at the Nationals as long as they're held. Pretty excited about that. What about you guys? I'm super stoked. I've never, I've never been to a Nationals, and I've just been to regional shows, and those are great, but I can't wait to see what we get. As far as it uh, happening, I, I understand that the mayor of Las Vegas is shooting for May 1st of this year to have the the city completely open all the shows and everything back running full time. So I think we're good. I think it's going to happen. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely leaning towards it's, it's almost certainly happening. Yeah. I'm super hopeful every day we cross our fingers, you know, there's a lot more going on in the world, but you know, some things we just have to hold with some hope. And this is one of them. I've, this will probably be, Oh my gosh, I bet maybe my 20th nationals. Wow. <laughs> I've been going well. I mean, It helps when your dad drags you along when you're a kid. I think my first was when I was six or seven years old, and now I'm 34. But just just for our listeners who have never attended before, it'll be, you know, the 18th through the 21st of August 2021 in Las Vegas. It's hosted at the Rio. I know I'll be staying there, but I think TJ and the crew, you guys are staying down the street. Yeah, we're going to be over at the Luxor. Yeah, and and to be honest, you don't need to stay at the convention hotel, especially in this case. You know, Las Vegas, everything's so close. You know, go with the best price. I say, you know, more more money to spend in the vendor room. You know, in terms of the Rio itself, they've sold over twenty eight hundred days, which I believe is a record. That's that's pretty astounding. Now the show does spread across four days. It starts midday Wednesday and concludes Saturday night with the award ceremony. And I would recommend for new modelers, if you have the time and you can spend, you know, the whole four days, definitely recommend it. If you have limited time and you're looking for what day should I show up, it, I would definitely recommend being there Friday morning. Friday is the last day to register. So it's very important that, you know, if you're bringing something, you can register it on Friday. 
judging happens Friday night. And then Saturday, the show, you know, is, is kind of the last hurrah. You'll see vendors starting to blow out kind of their inventory because some of them don't want to take it back across overseas. And, and again, I'm very hopeful that some of our international partners can come over and support the show. Zuki Mora, Edward, these, these are really the highlights. Um, unfortunately, Wingnut Wings won't be back. But that's one thing about the Nationals is that you'll have the opportunity to engage, you know, with not only people, but vendors that you normally don't see typically. They've sold over 130 tables, completely sold out, and that that accounts for social distancing, so that's fantastic. The contest uh, itself is around 160 categories, and, and that's everything from sci-fi, aircraft, armor, and there'll be thousands of models on the table. Scott, have you been to a Nationals? I've never been to a Nationals, you know, been to a few regional shows, but this will be my first, so really looking forward to it. Oh my gosh, everybody. I'm I'm like the chaperone, I feel. <laughs> JB's going to be our tour guide, man. I'm so excited. It's four days long, but it'll go quick. And it's one of those events where I truly believe it is what you make of it. You know, you could you could go into the vendor room and then crash in your hotel room and, and it'd be just like a four day normal show. Or you can, you know, really engage with some friends and, and have the opportunity to see world class models again that you'd never see anywhere else. They'll also offer tours and then the you know the social atmosphere as well. Every night there's something going on. The award ceremony, you know, some of us dress up really corny. So the guys from Pittsburgh, you'll see us in khakis, black button ups, and then these red power ties. So we really strike an appearance when we're there. And uh, we'll be waving the Jolly Roger as well during the award ceremony. So again, uh, it's kind of a just a geek out, nerd out uh, four days. Uh, sounds awesome. Looking forward to seeing it and kind of experiencing a nationals and then uh, JB and, and TJ meeting you guys in person. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm most excited about. Your guys, you guys are going to figure it out just how boring Doug can be. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like I'm being catfished and I see you in person. It's going to all change. Well, I guess we're still digressing here, but um, we had a uh, some listener feedback that I want to hit on from our friend Rick Baker. He's uh, been with us from the beginning. He's always been there uh, uh, talking to us, but he brought something up. He says he recently saw a video from Round 2 on YouTube. It details their 2021 release slate, and they're, they've, they've apparently acquired the licenses for all the old Star Wars MPC and AMT Ertl kits. They state they're going to update the toolings and of the early kits, and they plan to introduce even new molds. So there are some great kits that they built. I mean, yeah, they're they're old and they're not up to Bandai standards, but I mean, there are kits that they made that we still can't get from Bandai. So let's keep our eyes open for that. The older kits, if you could actually, like they said in their video, retool some of them and maybe bring some modern tech in, the sizes of those kits are significantly different than the Bandai. So yeah, even though they're not going to have that Bandai engineering, a lot of guys are going to like those larger kits. That would be awesome to see a retooled, improved uh, Tidarium shuttle. Yes, if they can figure out how to make the, those folding wings actually stay put without splitting the fuselage halves that, that were such a nightmare on the old kit, that would be awesome. You know, this is really exciting news, Doug, because, you know, one of my first models I remember was that Hoth diorama of the AT-ATs and, you know, the snow speeders. So I'll be honest, I'd buy that thing again if they rebox it. Oh, yeah, I I had that. And the uh, the little the little uh, the little guns that came with it um, that, that the rebels had those. I used to know what they were called. The laser but, turrets. Sure. But they had names. Yeah, everything in Star Wars has names. Yeah, yeah, they had all kinds of cool stuff in those. In those I think sets. there was a little X wing as well, and the, uh -huh. uh, so and the troop troop transport maybe too in the back. I'm um, not sure. Did it? I have might that? I, I might be confusing two different dioramas, but yeah, those are cool. Really, I, I mean, they get you hooked in the hobby at such a young age. So I'm excited. Cool stuff. Anyway, and what what really excites me about this? If it depends on the price line once they're back out. It would be fun to have some some kind of inexpensive kits to to kind of play around with because one of my favorite things about sci-fi and Star Wars in particular is there are some beautiful things they did on screen, but you can have so much fun doing your own thing with those kits. And I'm kind of kind of excited to mess with it and and try my own paint schemes and and uh, see what I can make. 
you know, I was just going to say one other thing that that might be a huge benefit of this if this announcement is distribution. I think round two uh, has distribution with some of the major retailers in the United States. So this this only opens up the hobby, I think, to maybe more people as well. Uh, so that that's exciting. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, there's a lot of people that are intimidated by Bandai stuff because there's so much Japanese on the box top and also the instructions. Those old MPC Ertl kits are probably kind of a little bit of the old comfort, you know, thing where you see a new model kit of something that maybe you build as a kid and so you buy it for your son or your daughter to work on. So yeah, I think I think it's definitely going to bring some people into the hobby. Good stuff, guys. Let's look. We're, we're looking forward to it. Anyway, that's all I've got. Okay. Doug, did we have any listener feedback uh, this time? Again, yes. We've got lots and lots of listener feedback. I'll start off with one that actually kind of goes hand in hand with Nats coming up. Ethan Eidenmill, who's the webmaster at IPMS San Diego, is telling us that IPMS San Diego, in cooperation with the San Diego Model Car Club and the San Diego Air and Space Museum, are going to be holding the San Diego Model Expo on June 5th, Saturday, June 5th, at San Diego Air and Space Museum Annex at Gillespie Field. You can go to www.ipmssd.org to find out more information. So that's coming up. That's something, you know, to to break in those people that want to go to a show that are in the Southwest United States. That uh, That's coming up soon. We've got a, a, a friend, Ivan Jensen Taylor, who says he's loving our podcast and he loves our chemistry. And he wants to talk about one of the previous comments from our last episode about younger modelers. He's 23 years old. He's been modeling since 2015, and he's been featured in some magazine and publications. He's learning a lot from the podcast, but he's also interested in trying to help others who want to improve. So if you ever want to have a tra- chat from a younger person's perspective, we'll let him know. All right. That sounds like something I think we ought to look into. Yeah, Ivan's uh, had some good comments, and we've got some other younger guys. Zach Grizzle's been on the on the podcast page a lot, and he's young, and he he's had some great feedback too. So yeah, maybe we need to put together a kind of a younger modelers roundtable. That might be fun. That would be really cool. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Just to, I want to give a shout out to Ivan. He's he's a fantastic modeler. I've been following his work for a long time. So great work, Ivan. Keep it up, and and thanks for the great feedback. Rod from Colorado, also a younger guy. He's thirty two, which for me that's really young. Um, he's, uh, he's enjoying our podcast as well and would like, uh, like to, to hear a round table and maybe even weigh in on his, uh, on it himself. Um, he wants us to start sharing links to, uh, the things we talk about, all the pages and stuff. And, and as Scott mentioned earlier, we're working on it. It's coming Rod and, uh, and thanks for the feedback. Uh, Sebastian found your podcast, started listening and he says, we're awesome. We are awesome. Do you, are are we I awesome? <laughs> I think we're awesome. Uh, anyway, keep it up and happy modeling. Best wishes wishes from Sweden. Awesome. Uh, he's thinking of starting a scale model podcast in Swedish. Awesome. There are there are no podcasts in Swedish for scale modelers. Awesome, dude. If you want to give us any uh, uh, pick our brains for any ideas, I'm sure we'll all be willing to pitch in. Keep it up. Terry Wilkinson, greetings guys in episode 13 was completely off the grid. You continually keep, you continually keep raising the bar. TJ, I still contend that even after listening to Mike that OPR is pure sorcery. Yeah, there's no it, doubt it about is. that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I was saying the other day um in our little group chat that it frustrates me. It makes me so angry cuz he makes it look so easy when you when you watch a video because there's videos of him on YouTube doing it. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, just it's like Bob Ross like, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, just put a little oil paint here and you can just blend it right on it and, and you'll get what you want. I'm like, because I do it. It doesn't do anything that I want. <laughs> and we've got uh, feedback from Brian Schultz. I know it's going to be a good day as I'm getting ready for work and see a new episode downloading. Great job as always. And now I'm hiding in the shitter, <laughs> scrambling to find some TIE fighter kits on the interwebs because I want to play too. Be careful, Brian. We don't want to get you fired, man. Thanks for being a being a fan of the show and all, but make sure you keep your job, buddy. John Brian, hello to the Triple P. I just thought I'd drop you a line and thank you for such an excellent podcast. He appreciates all the scale modeling podcasts and he's enjoyed the recent armor roundtable discussion. 
even even as a dedicated die die hard aircraft modeler, he made nothing but airplanes since 1994. It was great to have more voices and opinions to listen to. If I may adopt the reverse position and speak of armor modeling as an interested but ignorant observer, he wonders the following: Would it be even be possible to have an aircraft modeling roundtable with significant personalities involved? Oh, we're working on it. It's coming. Spoiler alert. My perception is that aircraft modeling, which I have followed very closely for 27 years, is a hugely divided community with quite tribal loyalties and partisan discussion. You can almost define the tribes by the modeling personalities they venerate, and their uh, fields of influence are loosely demarcated by the many magazines, webzines, forums, Facebook groups that exist, and many in perpetual animosity with each other, without a doubt. Armor, armor modeling work, looks more harmonious with the big players generally agreed upon. Uh, Mig, Adam Wilder, Uncle Night Shift, John Bonani. Is this true or am I just being naive or misinformed? I, I think, I, I mean, it's a generalization, of course. But I, I think um, we've all kind of seen that the, that, that the armor community seems to be a little more, I don't, I don't want to say friendly, but it seems like that the armor modeling influencers tend to really kind of reference each other and and uh, almost build in tribute to each other where there does seem to be a little bit of competition in aircraft modeling. What do you guys think about that? I'm certainly just honored to be mentioned in the same phrase as some of those luminaries before uh, my name was mentioned. And, you know, you bring up a good point, Scott. I, I find the armor community, you know, really supportive of each other. You, you listen to their blogs, you know, even articles, YouTube pages. And as you mentioned, they constantly reference each other. And, and it's almost like one influences the other. And there's this back and forth of growth. And, and maybe that's why uh, armor modeling is the coolest modeling. Sorry, I just said it. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, that it is interesting that they do that because they don't, it's not that they one up each other it's someone will develop a technique or try something new and the the other big names are like oh that's really awesome i should try that and then they kind of do their own spin on it and then then it just evolves and then you know you know look where like like whitewash like using hairspray for whitewash i was just watching that video from rinaldi talking about it it was like 2004 or 2007 so really i mean not that long ago when People figured out, or well, Phil Sudikis, or however you say his last name, figured out you can use uh, hairspray for winter whitewash, and then everyone just kind of took it and ran with it. But there's no, doesn't seem like anyways any any animosity towards each other for you know using their their technique because no one, uh, from what I see, it doesn't seem like anyone claims something is their technique. That they're more than happy that everyone is trying it and seeing if they can do it better or different or to, to grow the, the style, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, JC Osborne in, in that round table brought up a great point that, you know, when it, do, when it, when you do see an aircraft model that is really well weathered, that it really kind of takes it to a, a, another level. A great example of that is the P 38 lightning that Tony Bell, who's our guest, Later on in this episode, did the new Tamiya P thirty eight just beautiful, and he really used a lot of what most people would call quote armor uh, weathering techniques on that model. And so I think there's that aspect of it. And then and then the other thing is, like I said, this is a bit of a generalization, you know, as far as aircraft versus armor. But you know, we, whether you like aircraft, whether you like sci fi, whether you like you know Warhammer, we like it all. So it's all welcome here on the on the posse. Yeah, I think, you know, one one final comment about armor modeling and kind of the general community. We don't deal with gloss coat. So I think that adds a lot of angst among aircraft modelers. You know, we we kind of stray away from that and avoid that drama. So maybe maybe that's You're not using future on your on your tanks. Yeah, that only only for wet effects. So it's really easy and less controversial. OK, he had one more question. Similarly. There seems to be uh, more agreement amongst the armor modelers as to what constitutes an acceptable finish. I know there are disagreements in modulation, anyone, but it looks like the vast majority are settled on the fact that armor models need mud, dust, chipping, etc. 
In that sense, the sequence for finishing your average armor model looks easier, not in terms of technique or execution, but in vision, compared to an aircraft model. When it comes to aircraft, you only need to mention panel lines and you'll create a fight. Almost nothing seems agreed upon in terms of what the finished model should look like. Consequently, an aircraft modeler is not only battling with the technical side of things, but whole loads of voices that say, it should look like this, or again, am I being naive? Yeah, I don't think you're you're being naive at all, John. And And I mean, this is fantastic feedback. And honestly, we could probably do a roundtable discussion on just just this feedback alone. I mean, you've really brought up a lot of really interesting points that we could delve deeper into. So, um, l- l- Doug, let's hold on to this. And uh, as we uh, create new episodes, let's uh, dive deeper into this. Thanks a lot, John. Great feedback. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Rick Baker, we already talked about um, round two. He also just wanted to add, welcome to John Bonani. You are a seamless addition, and it was a treat to hear you get officially deputized. Looking forward to hearing the next ride. Oh, thank you. Um, another great friend of ours at the Posse, uh, uh, Neil Gilborn. Uh, hi, guys. Hope all is well. Podcast is super and evolving really well. Being, been doing an Airfix, Airfix starter kit old school style, only paints and a hairy stick to go with a Revel 130 second Spitfire as part of an IPMS club group build. Nice. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see some pictures of that, Neil. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, Len Geisler. Just started listening to days. You guys are killing me soft me. Bought a tank on the way home today. <laughs> Thanks, Len. That's our feedback for today. Awesome. Well, we appreciate that feedback. Hey, TJ, if uh, they want to, if our listeners want to leave us feedback, how do they do that? Yeah, just uh, head over uh, to our uh, Facebook page and you can find us Plastic Posse Podcast on Facebook. Go ahead and shoot us a message. You know, we, we get them all. We read them all and uh, we always respond. Or you can email us at uh, plasticpossipodcast at gmail.com. All right. Well, let's take a minute here and hear from our sponsor, Anthony Goodman from Goodman Models. Anthony, take it away. Hey, this is Anthony from Goodman Models. You're listening to the Plastic Posse Podcast. This is the podcast for miniatures, Star Wars, science fiction models, and everything in between. And while you're listening in, Working on your models, pick up a set of super sanding blocks, tools that will help you sand with precision. Check them out at GoodmanModels.com and keep the glue to your sprue. Now it's time for our main segment. You're going to love the interview we did with modeler extraordinaire Tony Bell. Enjoy. Welcome into another awesome interview segment with the Plastic Posse. Today, we are very, very excited to be joined by modeler extraordinaire, Tony Bell. So, John, take take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. You know, I'm really excited to have Tony here. Tony, you probably don't know this, but I, I knew about you probably, oh my gosh, when I was a kid and you're like, what? And so growing up, going to shows with my dad, when he saw your work, he always made a point to say, oh, that was built by Tony Bell. It looks awesome. So I have been a big fan of your work for a very long time. Your aircraft are fantastic. You know, your armor is incredibly realistic. And now you're even dipping your toe into sci-fi. So I would classify you as a, as a complete modeler. And, and your set of skills can easily transfer between those genres. So, you know, maybe to kick this session off, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, modeling interests, and, and even outside of the hobby to give our listeners, you know, a good picture of who you are. Yeah, sure. Love to. And, and thanks for having me, guys. I, I really appreciate it. I'm following on the heels of uh, the illustrious Mike Rinaldi, I'm not sure that I'm going to be uh, nearly as well-spoken, intelligent, and accomplished as he is, but you know, might be a little bit of a letdown for your listeners. But, uh, yeah, to, to, to the specific question, I, uh, I, I hail from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm sure some of your listeners are going to pick up on uh, the accent a little bit. I live in a city called Guelph right now, which is probably about an hour west. I'm I'm an aerospace engineer, have been for about 30 years. I've worked on everything from 
CF-18s to the International Space Station and everything in between. And, you know, my love of models and you know, my chosen profession are actually very much uh, interlinked. I, I generally build aircraft, which is no surprise to anybody. But as you know, John mentioned, I do dip my toes in the, uh, in the sci-fi and, and armor world. I actually have more sci-fi in my cabinet than I do have armor. But that's a, uh, it's still a relatively small proportion. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump right in. How do you choose to build a model? And you know, what's your motivation for your chosen subject? And related to that, you know, what's a preferred scale? Or um, do, you, do you have a preferred scale? Or is it just whatever you feel like at that particular time? Well, yeah, my preferred scale is 48 scale aircraft. I mean, that's just kind of whatever, what, what's in my cabinet. And I don't like to mix scales too much. Although, you know, I've been building a couple of the odd uh, Wingnut Wings kit, which of course are all at 30 second scale. And they're just absolutely glorious. But it, how I choose the next subject, that is just, I bounce back and forth. I've got kind of a bunch of ideas that kind of percolate to the top of my brain. I'll just sort of, you know, when I'm picking up the next project, I'll just take the one that happens to be sort of at the top of that, that mental pile. And so it tends to be rather random at times. Lately, I've been delving into more esoteric uh, subjects. Like the, my current project is the 135th scale, uh, you know, phalanx point missile defense SeaWiz system, which is unlike anything I've ever built in terms of subject matter, in terms of just the way the kit is. It's just, it's absolutely mind blowing the amount of fiddly details in it. And the, the, the way I chose that was it had been percolating to the top. And, um, you know, like John, I, I contribute to uh, a handful of magazines and Brett Green, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, uh, was in touch with me and had asked me to uh, contribute something to the uh, military uh, magazine in their, in their stable. And I suggested this and he was all over it like a, like a wet blanket. So that's how <laughs> that one ended up on my bench. That build is really intriguing all the photo etch work that you're doing i mean it's a beautiful subject it is and and i i sort of cut my didn't get to say cut my teeth but I, I i got really involved with photo etch building uh the ibg bedford qlr radio truck which again that was a that was a subject that i had been literally wanting to do since i was about 12 years old when i saw it in the old uh military modeler magazine and when IBG came out with it, uh, I, I was I had to have it. And uh, Part and Edward both created photo etch sets for it, which were actually quite complementary to one another. And you know, with fenders and boxes and jerry can racks and everything. And for strength, I had to solder it. And so I I, I really taught myself, uh, you know, how to deal with large photo etch assemblies by working on that one. And that one translated rather nicely into this phalanx. Oh man, I'll say that. I'm glad you brought that Bedford truck up. The uh, Mickey Mouse camo that you put on that, that's one of your models that I would say is probably my favorite. You just did such a beautiful job on that one and the the finish was outstanding. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I and I love that scheme. That that scheme has intrigued me, like, like I say, ever since I was a kid. Yeah, Scott, I just got to echo your sentiments. Certainly my favorite, uh, you know, obviously I'm armor biased, so probably that's why. But, you know, I was fortunate enough to see it at Heritage Con. So not only seeing it up close in person, and then you did that fantastic article in Model Military International, uh, and you're even graced the cover and, and well-deserved yeah. in that regard. And, and just a fantastic build, like you said, not only highlights construction, you know, mastering, soldering in those large photo etch but also the finish as well is just overall 10 out of 10. So Tony, um, some of your work, actually a lot of it, it seems like is, is based on historical photos. You said you kind of go from subject to subject or whatever, but can we talk a little bit about your process when you, when you do find a photo of how you replicate an exact subject or maybe an exact story that you're trying to tell? Well, yeah, sure. Cause Again, being an aircraft modeler, the difference between aircraft and armor, I find aircraft to be a much more sort of surgical 
kind of modeling, whereas armor tends to have a lot more artistic latitude available to it. Being an aircraft modeler, I don't have the eye that a lot of armor modelers like John, like like Rinaldi have for making something look sort of natural and realistic and organic, I guess is a good word for it. I can't do that off the top of my head. I, I, I don't have that vision. So I have to rely on photos to be able to go, okay, yeah, this is where the schmutz is going to concentrate. This is where the chips are going to be. This is where the, you know, the, the paint is going to be worn as opposed to flaking away. And when I see it, it makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, of course it's going to be there like that. But when I'm staring at a blank canvas of a model that hasn't uh, been either painted or weathered yet, I don't, I don't necessarily see that. And so I have to, you know, I comb through references. I, you know, over the years, I've been gathering pictures from the interwebs and sticking them away on a, on a hard drive. I've got literally, you know, gigabytes, terabytes of photos that I've sort of organized into folders. And even, you know, stuff that I don't have any intention of building anytime soon, I'll just kind of thumb through the pictures and, and look at them and absorb, you know, where, you know, where the interesting bits are, where the wear is, all that kind of thing. And that's how I internalize it enough so that I can then translate that into a model. So it sounds like, is it fair to say that your background as an aerospace engineer sort of plays into that approach of, since you're not 100% comfortable with the more artistic element, you sort of approach it like an engineer would with lots of reference materials and comparisons? A absolutely, yeah. My I take a very sort of technical approach to doing it as opposed to an artistic approach. And that's something I've been trying to loosen up about to break out of in in my more recent builds. And I think, you know, for instance, the Scale Model or Critique Group is an awesome uh, inspiration for that because you see a lot of the guys on there posting their stuff that that is really sort of pushing it in terms of especially aircraft weathering the aircraft and and making them look more again not more like armor but as interesting as armor can be um we wanted to talk to you about um one of your recent uh, completions that beautiful p38 p38f you did if you can uh, talk to us a little bit about what you wanted to accomplish with the finish and how you reached that that finish, uh, specifically uh, like the chipped paint around the cockpit, which was just beautifully done. It's a it's a new Tamiya kit. What else can you say about it? It was it was absolutely glorious in terms of how well engineered it was and and just how beautifully it went together. Every you know, literally every single step of that of of that build process, you know, I, I would, I would grin at it and go, wow, that's cool. You know, the way they thought of something, but that also brings sort of a, a bit of pressure because it's like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to mess this up. You know, I've got to make sure that this goes together. I want to do this justice. And so it took me quite a long time to build that one. That was about a, an eight month build for me. And yeah, you know, what I wanted to get out of that was especially the camouflage P38s that you see pictures of they were they were ridden hard and put away wet they were not pampered you know machines there's this very distinct of course wear pattern on the top of the wings cuz the uh, the pilot and the crews would would get up onto the aircraft from a ladder that's at the trailing edge and then tromp up the the big broad wing there and you know get at the fuel filler caps and the and the cockpit and so forth and that created this very distinctive wear pattern that that hints at the underlying structure. And so you can't just sort of chip a broad area around there and, and call it a day. You've got to, if you really want it to look convincing, you've, you've got to imagine the stringers and the, the spars and you know where this is going to wear. So I studied the, the pictures as best I could to get a good idea of how specifically this this wore away and of course i i used the the hairspray technique which is you know obviously well familiar to armor modelers and it was actually the very first time that i've tried the hairspray technique in anger let's just say on a, on a project and a in a broad scale 
And so, of course, you know, I undercoated it with a silver, which was uh, the Tamiya LP11 lacquer, which is a stunning paint. It's just great. You know, not the best for a natural metal finish, but for chipping, uh, you can't beat it. I'm just sitting here looking at a photograph of the of the view of that area that you're talking about. And this was your first time doing this. Oh my gosh, dude, just <laughs> well, well done. Well, thanks. But now in all, in all honesty, I did have an old Academy P38 that I used as a, a practice mule before, before tackling the, uh, the, the Tamiya kit. So as I was building the Tamiya kit, I slapped together the Academy P38 to, to run through the techniques before applying them to the, to the Tamiya. And that, that actually was a big help because it, it allowed me to experiment with, you know, how thick should I lay on the, the hairspray? How much water should I put on? You know, what implements should I use to, to chip? And what I ended up doing was, you know, using a little less hairspray than I tried on the paint mule. So it's actually a fairly thin coat. The paints on top of that are Tamiya acrylics, um, and they were applied very thin. I, I like to paint small, so to speak. So whenever I'm painting, I, I dial it right down, and I'm just painting small areas at a time, very thin coats, lots of layers. But of course, you have to make sure that it's, you know, you get it done in time to be able to chip it before the paint cures. I tackled it by putting very little water on it, actually, just enough to moisten it. You know, I used toothpicks like everybody does and a, and a very short, bristled, stiff paintbrush. But the best implement I found for doing the very detailed chipping was a, um, a sewing needle in a pin vise. And I ground the tip of the sewing needle just a little tiny bit flat so that it kind of had a bit of an edge to it. And what I would do is I would, I would actually push the paint out of the way. And that, and there, and I was, it was, I was able to really control it. And, and, you know, it was, you had to have a very light touch in order to avoid scraping the underlying silver. But uh, that's how I got those little structure lines and things like that. So that wasn't, you know, that wasn't anything crude, like a, like a paintbrush and scrubbing away at it. That was a very, targeted narrow approach with that uh with that sewing needle and pin vice yeah almost like a surgical approach yes very much so i was just going to say to expand on that to give to give listeners you know frame of reference on your chipping process how how long did that take maybe start to finish you know from from laying down that initial hair spray coat to that you know that final chipped finish just just to kind of give an understanding like you mentioned paint small be surgical. These things take time. And, and maybe that's an important thing to understand is how, how long does this process take? It was, it was kind of a marathon session. I mean, in terms of, you know, calendar days, I did it over the space of about three days. However, those were long days because I, I needed to get in there and, and do the chipping before the paint hardened up enough that it wasn't possible anymore. And anybody who's done it, especially with Tamiya lacquers, or sorry, Tamiya acrylics, knows that you've got maybe two days at the most to play around with them until they harden up and you can't you can't chip it anymore right and the longer you go between those two days the the harder it is to chip it even in that time frame i've noticed and and i can actually wait a little longer if i want to chip less if i want to have a little bit uh, smaller chips i'll actually wait longer to start the chipping process yeah, yeah, then that's a good way of regulating the, the the size exactly as you as you indicate. But yeah, it was about uh, there were like those were three like eight hour painting session days just to to sort of power through it and get it all done while I could. It was it was stressful to be honest. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the most relaxing modeling I've ever done. Well, it certainly paid off. It looks fantastic. You know, one other thing I want to note on this build is the exhaust stains. And for, for the armor modeler coming into the aircraft world, one thing that stood out to me this model and some of the characteristic features of a P-38 are those stains coming from, from the engines. Can you, can you talk about maybe why they're more of an earth color than your standard black and, and what causes that? Well, and that's where sort of the, the research kind of comes in because the, what you see on a lot of allied aircraft are the exhaust stains with that kind of tan color to them. And what that is, is actually um, tetraethyl lead deposits, because, you know, back in the bad old days, they used to add lead to the, to the fuel so that, you know, they could have the ultra high compression 
in, in the engines and they wouldn't you know detonate and so those that and that stuff would deposit on the, the fuselage or the booms as the case may be again you know referring to uh, the the historical uh, pictures and you know being an american plane fortunately there's a number of decent color pictures from back in the day you know again i just i went with what i saw as opposed to trying to imagine what these stains would look like yeah i just i used to me a buff primarily to me a buff thin down gosh probably about 20 to 1 with with rubbing alcohol i find rubbing alcohol is a great thinner for that sort of application because it flashes off so quickly and you just build it up in layers layer after layer after layer after layer and you make a little mistake it doesn't show because it's so thin right and i and i'm glad you mentioned this because i i think for maybe new modelers and even advanced modelers it's important to understand to achieve these effects they are marathons and and what you've been describing from the paint chips to how to apply exhaust and the methodical nature involved in going after these certain effects is really important to drive home. I think that's something that's lost sometimes in internet forums where someone will post a picture and it's like, oh yeah, I just did X, but they don't understand what X actually involves is a whole alphabet behind it to, to really just work through. Um, so really appreciate your perspective on that. And that's what I love about videos. You know, you, you get to see sort of, you know, how the guy's hand moves, how, you know, how much thinner they're applying or, you know, how much oil paint they're dabbing on, you know, that kind of thing where you don't, you simply don't get that from a still image and a, and a written description. Exactly. And I, I think that's probably why, I think we mentioned Uncle Night Shift almost like 40 times an episode, but it, it truly, what you just said exemplifies probably why his channel is so successful because you're seeing how the sausage is made. And and your, your comment about how the hand moves, little subtle things like that can, can really change the effects on a model. And, and that's, that's just really great to hear. Yeah, I actually had a friend over uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, John Chung. I think you, you've met Yeah, him, I've John. met John. Yeah, good aircraft model. Yeah, and oh, outstanding aircraft model. Just brilliant. And, but he's one of these guys who does a very clean detailed surgical kind of look and he's been he's been trying to branch out of that and and he was over at my place and we were talking about airbrushes and he's like oh you know i gotta get myself a, a custom micron because i can't spray small and and so forth and so on i'm like well you know come on down to the basement here let me let me show you what i can you know what i do with my iwata revolution cr with a the half millimeter nozzle on it you know so i just demonstrated some spraying small that i do because this is what he had been struggling with. And it clicked with him immediately. Like he saw me doing it and he's like, oh, well, well damn. And I handed him my airbrush and he was able to do it just by, you know, he's, he's an experienced airbrusher. And so he knows the you know, how to handle an airbrush. But it wasn't until he saw me actually doing it, like how close I was getting in. And all those, all those little, like you say, the subtleties. And then he was like, well, damn, okay. I you know, went home and, and was able to, you know, was able to start playing around with it. It was, it was really cool. Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that's great. That's great feedback. And, and like you said, it just, just being exposed to it, seeing it firsthand. And, and that's why, you know, it's important if there's ever a seminar or a show, go attend because you might learn something just like this that, that you can't pick up uh, otherwise. So no, that's, that's great. Yeah. And speaking of seminars, I, I attended a couple by Rinaldi. You were actually able to see the seminar with Mike in person? Attended a couple of uh, seminars with Mike Rinaldi. What, what can you say? It's Mike Rinaldi. The man's brilliant and, and humble, too. He wouldn't, you know, he'd probably be blushing to hear us say this. But again, the, the value of those seminars was just simply watching him, you know, how much, again, how much paint he applied, sort of how fast the stroke is, even, you know, something like anything like that is, is so useful to watch. Oh, that's great. Doug, did you want to touch on the tie interceptor? Yeah, we'll just uh, take what you've talked about a little bit um, with that P38, and you did a beautiful tie interceptor, a much simpler finish than a, than a P38, but it's it's wonderful. Star Wars is kind of my thing, so so uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the Tie Fighter was the project that immediately followed on the heels of the of the P38, and I really wanted something that was just kind of very simple, straightforward, easy, and fun. 
like you, I've been an, a Star Wars fan since, you know, since 1977, when I was a 10 year old kid watching it in the movie theaters, I swear to God, I have lost count of how many times I've seen Star Wars in the theaters, let alone on video and so forth afterwards. So I'm a massive Star Wars fan. So the TIE Fighter, TIE Interceptor was the perfect project. Of course, the challenge with that is, you know, how do you make a gray and black finish interesting? I mean, there's all the greeblies and details and all that kind of thing to add interest to the surface. But to make the paint look interesting is really quite a challenge. All of the sort of TIE fighters that I'd seen on on Facebook and other social media, you know, they're cool because they're TIE fighters. The finishes have never been all that all that interesting. The only TIE fighter that I've seen that has a, a, a really engaging finish was by Andy Moore. And I'm sure you guys recognize that name. Uh, he does absolutely brilliant Star Wars stuff. Yeah, he's terrific. Yeah. And so, you know, I studied his stuff real close and came to the conclusion that, like I say before, painting small was the key. And so when I, you know, when I finished putting together the, the mainest, you know, the main parts, you know, I kept the, uh, the solar panels separate. So I had the, the, the central cockpit ball and the, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, the spars that the, that the solar panels attached to. So, yeah, and to do that, I started off by, uh, you know, with, with a primer, as I always do. Uh, my, my favorite primer is uh, simply Mr. Surfacer 1000, not 1500 for some reason, but 1000 seems to work best for me. Thinned with Mr. Color Leveling Thinner. And then, you know, I, I, did, I did appreciating, which, uh, you know, is a bit of a dirty word these days, but I still use that technique a lot. Um, it adds a layer as far as I'm concerned. So appreciated with, uh, with black. And, you know, just your typical spray it along the lines and the nooks and crannies and so forth and get a little random here and there. And then I took the gray, which was the uh, Tamiya TS32 Haze Gray, which comes in the spray bomb. Um, of course, I decanted that into a, into a jar uh, so I could run it through my airbrush. And, um, yeah, just started scribbling. You know, I thinned it right down with, uh, with Mr. Color Rapid thinner, um, which I find is better for, for spraying small than the leveling thinner, and dialed the spray pattern right down to, you know, about a millimeter. So really small, got in real close. So, you know, the airbrush is maybe a half an inch uh, away from the surface. And you can tell I'm Canadian because I'm mixing up Imperial and, uh, and metric. <laughs> Um, and just, you know, little squiggles and clouds and s scribbles and keeping the paint kind of generally speaking in the middle of the, of the, the, the panel areas, but less so on the, the panel lines and shadowed areas, but still crossing over that kind of thing. And again, it takes quite a while to, to paint even something as small as a 70 second scale TIE fighter, because you're just, you're spraying such a teeny tiny little area all at once. And then, you know, uh, once covered the whole model doing that, went back over with a slightly lighter shade. So add a bit of white, same idea, maybe thin it down just a little bit more so it's a little more translucent and do the same thing. And then, you know, take a slightly darker shade and do the same thing. And then take, uh, and this is actually one of, one of the most important steps I find, is go back to the original shade Thin it right down so that you've got, like, again, maybe 95% thinner, 5% paint, maybe 90, 10. And, and just do a, a filter over the whole surface. And that really unifies the, the colors. Oh, that's, that's fascinating, airbrushing a filter, similar to what armor modelers do with using a paintbrush to apply a filter, but you're actually kind of tinting and unifying your finish. That's fantastic. Yeah, and that, I find that that you can get a lot of control over the intensity of the effect. So when I'm there with the different shades and painting small and things like that, I'll, I'll, I'll make it really intense. And then I can always dial back from that by how much filter I, I apply at the end. And I do this for, you know, not just the TIE Fighter, but that's also how I did the olive drab on the P38 or the you know, neutral gray underneath. And then maybe, oh darn, I put a little bit too much filter on, and I, you know, it's not as as 
you know, not as much depth to the finish as I wanted. So then I'll go back with the light and the dark. And it's a really back and forth multi-light. It's not a, you know, ABC, you know, cookbook approach. It's, it's a, you know, do this, do that, dial it all back, reassess, maybe touch this area up a little bit more. And so I'm constantly going back and forth. And I know, again, I know it's something that, that, some people kind of turn their nose up at, but I, I do a lot of mixing in the cup for this sort of work. So I'll just, I'll, I'll take an eyedropper, squirt some thinner in, take my base color and a paintbrush, you know, mix it in, take the you know paint, same paintbrush, add a little tiny bit of white. Nope, not enough. Add a little bit more and start spraying. Now that's a little too heavy. Add a bit more thinner, that kind of thing. So it's a very, there's a, there's a real flow to it. Tony, I'd like to disagree with something you said a little earlier, that you're not artistic at all. I mean, what you've just described is absolutely more of an artistic approach. You're using your eye, you're building opacity gradually, you're blending, you're chasing it, you know, you're you're dialing your contrast up and down. Yeah, that's not engineering, that's art, buddy. <laughs> you're right. But however, I've been doing this long enough that I've established it as a tool in my box so that I don't have to, I don't have to think about that anymore. And yeah, you're right. At this point, it's become uh, a, a seat of the pants, a more artistic you know, endeavor, but I had to start out by looking at it and dissecting, you know, how does, you know, how do the, what are the layers in, you know, this person's finish? I'll be looking at somebody's model kind of going, okay, you know, it looks like they did, you know, appreciating followed by this, followed by that, followed by this, followed by that. And, and over time, I developed my own technique, but it, it's an approach that is still sort of clinical. The, the end result looks artistic, but the approach is, is still, I find, very clinical, which I don't mind at all. It's how I get, you know, it's how I do it. That's how I operate. That's how my brain works. The goal is the measurement of your eyeball, right? The Mark I eyeball is telling you that you've achieved success. Yes, yeah, and it's it's developing that vision is the is the challenge. And when it comes to other techniques like OPR, pigments even, you know, because I I live mainly in the aircraft world, I don't quite have the same maturity of vision, let's just call it, with those techniques as I do with say airbrushing. So, a question we like to ask uh, in, any modeler that we talk to, what is your favorite step when it comes to making a model, taking the uh, masks off a of canopy, no question about it. <laughs> it is just so satisfying because it, up, up until that point, it's really everything's a work in progress. You know what I mean? Like it's the light at the end of the tunnel, like peeling away and, and seeing the contrast between the the paint finish, which is usually you know pretty flat, and the, and the, the surrounding weathering, chipping, what have you, and then the sort of the nice pristine clear canopy and you, you, you glimpse the inside of the cockpit again you know which you haven't seen in in my case you know weeks or even months because that's how slow i work uh yeah that's that's always hands down my favorite favorite aspect of the build as far as you know the actual you know building versus painting versus it's it's kind of strange because it depends on how long I've been working at whatever aspect of it. You know, when I'm, when I'm just cracking open a box and I'm starting to cut the pieces off the sprue and I'm putting, you know, gluing bits together. And th at that point, construction is what really gets my juices flowing. And I don't want to see a pot of paint. I like, you know, I like seeing the physical object coming together. And then, you know, after a while, okay, you know, I need to, need to see some progress here. Let's, uh, let's, let's get some paint on this baby. And, you know, with aircraft, of course, you got to do all the internal bits before you can pull the fuselage together and attach the wings and the empennage and all that sort of thing. And so, you know, and at that point, you know, okay, I'm kind of sick and tired of construction. I'm really looking forward to getting some paint on here. I guess it's, it's seeing the progress that really sort of keeps me engaged. And, you know, sometimes there's, there'll be a project where, you know, I get, kind of stalled on something that doesn't allow me to see that progress. And I find that that can be a real mojo killer. And that's when I just have to kind of power through it and get to that next phase that'll re-engage my interest. No, that's great. So that, so kind of expanding on your great finishes, you know, you, you post a picture online once about all the airbrushes you own and, you know, we, we love tools as modelers, 
So, so let's talk about those airbrushes and maybe expand on, you know, you, you mentioned earlier uh, the Iwata that you have, but, you know, in general, how many do you have, you know, why do you think you have so many more importantly, maybe, and then which is your favorite and, and why? Well, I have all these airbrushes because they're pretty. <laughs> I'm serious. It's like, it's one of those things, you know, it's like you've got a nice watch and you, and you go to a, you know, you, you go to the department store and you see a case of other nice watches and you think, wow, that's a nice watch. I'd like that watch. Even though the watch you have on your wrist is a nice watch and it works just great. Or bicycles. I used to be a, you know, avid cyclist. Bikes are really pretty pieces of engineering and machinery. Same thing with airbrushes. You know, they just, they're precise, they're shiny there's an appeal to them. And, you know, you're always thinking, okay, you know, if I get the perfect airbrush, it's going to up my game. It's going to, it's going to be a game changer that is just going to click and work. You know, I've tried, I got a, um, a Sotar 2020. I had a Badger 105. I had the, the, the pistol grip Grex. Um, I had a cheap Chinese knockoff, uh, clone of the Iwata, the Micron, thank you. And you know, it was a cheap Chinese knockoff, but it was a it was actually a pretty good, you know, pretty good knockoff. And yet, none of them were a, a significant enough improvement over my workaday Iwata Revolution CR Gravity Feed half millimeter needle nozzle that they were worth sort of learning again because each. Chairbrush has its own quirks and strengths and weaknesses and things like that. But I've been using this revolution for literally 20 years. It's the same brush that I've had. I've replaced the odd part on it because I dropped the stupid thing. But it does everything I want. And it's just an absolute rock solid, reliable piece of kit. And so the other ones tend to gather dust. I, I don't really use them because I can get this revolution CR to do everything I want. Yeah, you know, you, you bring up a really good point, I, and I feel like I'm in the same boat where I probably have six airbrushes, but I always go back to my Iwata HPC. I've used it for, like you, 20 years. It does what I need, and, and I'm just comfortable with it. So it's 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 really interesting to share that with a, with another modeler. And, and I don't know if, you know, Scott, TJ, or Doug, if that's the same in your boat too. Yeah, I've got six or seven airbrushes, but I... I find that the airbrush that gets used the most and don't laugh at me here is my old Badger 200 detail single action. You know, if you're, if you're doing a primer coat or you're doing a, a clear or sometimes even a base coat, it's a single action brush, but it, it's, it, you can dial it down and meter it down and do a lot of really great overall finish work. And then the other brush that I go to again and again and again are my, Sotars, and I actually have all three of the Sotars, and I use those all the time. And um, like like Tony, I I really like to paint small, and the Sotars are fantastic at doing that. And I there's a buddy of mine in our you know local modeling club who does fantastic work. And same same thing as you, he's got a single action brush that he's been using since forever. He knows how to work it and work it well. And he gets awesome results for it with it, rather. And you know, I asked him, "Well, why don't you get yourself a double action? They're great." He's like, "Nah, don't need it." Honestly, a, a, a dual action brush. When you're talking about like a single coat, like a primer coat, why why introduce the variability of a double double action? You know, just kind of speaking theoretically here, when a single action is going to give you a constant. Um, consistent flow, which is what you need when you're putting down a single coat versus a, du- a, a dual action, especially if it's a large subject, you know, that finger is going to vary a little bit. So you, you might get some dusting, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, th- I think there's applications for both brushes, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. So while we're speaking about airbrushes, you know, Tony, you've mentioned to me acrylics, are there any other paints or, you know, is that your preferred paint to use? And and I'll also finish with, unfortunately, down in the States, we haven't been, you know, we don't get exposure to the Tamiya lacquer colors. So, you know, any any kind of feedback there and, and what kind of paint you prefer? Well, most of the paint that's, you know, sitting in my uh, drawer at my model desk is Tamiya. You know, I've been I've been using it forever. I know how to use it. Again, I get the results that I that I want out of them. You know, Gunzi is a little harder to find in my neck of the woods. 
I find that it works a little bit better than Tamiya, but it's I, I can't get it reliably. So, you know, I, I've got a few pots of that that kicking around for you know Luftwaffe subjects and things like that. But yeah, Tamiya, Tamiya acrylics, Mister Color leveling thinner, and you know isopropyl alcohol for doing sort of special effects and and fine work. I do have a couple of uh, jars of the the new lacquer paint, which is absolutely wonderful stuff. I just find their color line is a little limited. And, you know, if I'm going to be mixing colors, I'm just going to do it with with Tamiya acrylics. I tried using the mission model paints because they're actually fairly, you know, common in the local hobby shops around here. And, you know, the ad that you see in the magazines for mission model paints is change the way you paint. And I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, you know, it seems like a really catchy logo, but didn't really resonate with me. And so yeah, I, I, I use them for uh, the Tamiya Wildcat that I built uh, about two years ago now. And, and they worked okay, but it was, you know, it, it was, it wasn't relaxing because it was unfamiliar territory and I was, I was learning with them. And it's like, nah, I already know how to use Tamiya paints. I'm going to stick with them. I can certainly understand that. You know, when you are concentrating on your work and trying to get better and improve on, you know, the modeling aspects, you know, it's it's understandable that you don't want to change a process that's kind of become second nature. So that's, I think that's a natural reaction. Well, I was going to just add to that. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to spend time learning something, I'm going to I'm going to want to learn something I don't already know how to do or that I want to improve on you know a new technique a new uh, a new process a new finish as opposed to relearning something that I already know how to do with a different product. Well, why we're uh, talking about airbrushing and uh, you know taking things kind of to the next level. Tony, the first time you and I interacted was on Facebook, and um, you have the cutting edge scale modeling group that uses uh, that that you do masks for, and uh, you had done some masks and um, had me do a donation to, I believe, the American Cancer Society, and you sent me these files so I could cut masks. Are are you still doing that? And and uh, how if you are, how's that group going? Uh, well, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, actually. The, the the group is ticking along just fine. I I don't really contribute to it too much these days. However, yeah, what you mentioned is sort of something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I myself am a cancer survivor. I just actually had my my five years uh, cancer free anniversary last year, which is a bit of a milestone. So that's awesome. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with that. And so yeah, the deal is what happens is is that with the um, the silhouette series of, of cutters, um, I've developed uh, a library of useful files, like, you know, stars and bars and, uh, you know, German national insignia and all the British roundels and so forth and so on. And if somebody's just getting into uh, cutting their own masks with one of these machines, it can be a little bit of a daunting prospect to just come up with the things that are going to be used over and over and over again in the projects. And so what I did was I started, quote, you know, selling uh, these files to people who were interested. And the, the, the cost is, yeah, a donation to the Cancer Society. And it doesn't matter what Cancer Society it is. Could be, you know, if, if you're in Canada, the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, the American, whatever, whatever you can get a tax break for is really what I encourage people to do. And there's absolutely no fixed price on it. I just ask people to donate whatever they feel comfortable donating. Could be five bucks, could be 50 bucks. And I don't, I, it doesn't matter. It's just, the, you know, like Christmas, it's the thought that counts. And nor do I even ask for any proof. It's all in the honor system. So if somebody says, yep, I, I donated, then I take them at their word and I send them the link to the file and away we go. And one of the things that this has really been great for is that how many how how generous people can be it's really been quite amazing because if if i ask for 10 bucks to be paid into my own personal bank account i wouldn't have sold very many of these files because people just wouldn't be interested in, in paying that but when it's going to charity i i've been shocked at the amount of money that people have donated 
uh, you know, individuals have donated to, to, to get their, their hands on these files. Every single person that I've dealt with, and I've probably raised several thousand dollars doing this, has, has donated far more than a normal market rate would have been for these. So it's just been absolutely great. It's kind of restored a little bit of my faith in humanity. Man, that's, that's terrific. Where can, um, if somebody isn't familiar with these efforts, where's the best place like on Facebook or social media where they can hook up with you and, and see these files and make a donation? Well, I'm on the Scale Modelers Critique Group, um, which I guess a lot of your listeners would be familiar with. Um, it's the There's also the, the Cutting Edge is the name of the um, specific cutting machine group on Facebook. I'm also on sort of all the big ones, um, Advanced Modelers, uh, the Tamiya Model Magazine Group. So, you know, pr- pick just pretty much any of the mainstream, you know, Facebook groups and search for my name and they'll be able to get me. Just send me an instant message and I'll hook you up. Sounds great. No, that's awesome. You know, Tony, one thing that we're, you know, we're looking into here is is how can we bring the hobby and, and charity together? And, and that example that you show is is really great. And, and to hear the numbers that you're saying, you know, thousands of dollars, that, that is awesome. And it, it does restore some faith in humanity and, and show there's some good people in this hobby. And, you know, expanding on that, you know, maybe Tony, I can, I can uh, give you a personal commission, so to say, if, if you make some Balkan Kreutz for us armor modelers, and, and maybe we can work out something there as well to, to drive some more awareness uh, to, to your charity. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll hook up after this and we'll hammer out the details. I'd love to add some armor stuff into the, into the library. Fantastic. I know, you know, TJ and, and Scott and, and, and certainly, you know, we, ha- we have a good group. We have one going on T3485, uh, you know, something with, you know, Russian slogans, even I could, I could see that being a big hit in the near term. So yeah, we'll definitely connect and see what opportunities there are to, you know, get more people involved. Yeah, that would be awesome. Great. So, you know, one of the, you know, we're, we're coming up on the end. One of the things I'll, I'll talk about it. If someone wanted to see, you know, your work in person, you know, can you, you're from the Toronto area. Can you hit on some of the shows that you regularly attend? Such as they are now. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, there, there are a bunch of shows uh, in sort of the, the Southern Ontario, Great Lakes uh, states areas that, that I go to. There's yeah, Heritage Con, Wellcon, which is the one that's here in the, the Guelph area, uh, Buffcon in in Buffalo, uh, Nor'east Con, whenever it sort of ends up in uh, Western New York. I haven't been to any of the the Pennsylvania shows recently, but I really do need to to, to make the trip out there because you know all the guys from Pennsylvania come up to uh, Southern Ontario all the time. So we really should be returning the favor. We come up to drink the wine and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the show is, is simply a benefit of the journey. So that's, uh, that's good. Tony, thanks for your time. You know, this has been a fantastic discussion all the way from, you know, how you approach modeling and, and what those specific steps are and the methodical nature behind those techniques and what you're able to achieve but then also hitting on the charitable aspect of, of what you've been able to accomplish and, and you know, the, the help you've been able to give to these, you know, these worthy causes. And, and we look forward to expanding on that uh, in the near term. You know, one question that we'd love to just leave on is, you know, after this phalanx, what's next on your bench? Uh, good question. I don't know yet. Again, same idea. There's a bunch of things that have been percolating to the top. I think I'm going to end up getting something down off the shelf. Oh, doom. There's there's been a number of projects that that I have started and abandoned. One of my approaches is that I never work on more than one thing at a time. So if I'm if I lose steam on something, I put it in the put it in the box, put it back on the shelf, and start another project. And that's the only project that's on my bench. So one of the things that is on the shelf at Doom that's been you know quietly mocking me for years now is the Revel Ventura. So I started that one probably about 10 years ago, did a whole rivet job on the entire thing, like fuselage, wings, everything, and you know, have these visions of doing it up in, of course, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force markings, you know, all beat to crap because these were you know, long-term operational aircraft. Again, just lost steam on it, and it's been sitting in the box at about the 80% mark. So I think I might dig that one out and uh, get going on it again. 
It sounds intriguing. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, thanks so much, Tony. We really appreciate your time. We look forward to the new build, and, and please stay in touch. Yeah, we will do, and thanks for having me on. It's been a real blast. Thanks for coming on, Tony. Really appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again really soon. Love, looking forward to it. All right, take care. You too, bye-bye. Hope you all enjoyed our interview with Tony Bell. He's a, you know, he's a great friend of the podcast and he brings a really great perspective to this great hobby. So we hope to have him back soon and thank you again, Tony, and have a great day all. All right. That's it for episode 14. Thanks for listening. And thank you so much to our guest, Tony Bell. We really enjoyed that talk. Hope you did too. We're coming up on another round table for episode 15. So uh, stay tuned for that. It will be a science fiction theme discussion. So please uh, give us a listen. Until next time, to all of you out there in the posse, and especially to you guys, Doug, TJ, JB, have a great couple of weeks, and we'll talk to everybody soon. All right, you too, bud. See you guys. Cheers. We'll see you later.